Fine. And uh, of course, you've got the lean manager and lead with respect. So welcome, Michael. I want to thank you, first of all, for um, hey, educating us. This is great. Anytime we can get educated by a pro out in the industry doing the work uh, and, and, you know, somebody I highly respect, even though I didn't know you in the past, Michael, I, I really appreciate it. So, so welcome. Now, I don't know how many people are missing um, in, in the attendees list that should be panelists, but I'll try to change that throughout, you know, the time we've got. As panelists, we've got uh, Jerry Paulison, and, and I understand she's from the city of Denver. Uh, Mark Jabin, one of our coaches. Steve Dokus, he's the vice president. Um, we've got Johan from South Africa as a coach. Rafael Lucero from Spain as a coach. And where it says Dave, it's really the company I'm at right now, Bueller Furniture. And we've got a couple uh, people from there, the, the leading uh, team there. So one thing I should mention before we start, there's a Japanese mission. And that mission at Japan is with Norman Bodek and with um, one of our coaches. Um, so what's going to happen is if you guys want, want any um, information on this, please get a hold of our coach, uh, Rafael Lucero, and you could text them. And they're going to see uh, Takashi Harada from the Harada Method. So this should be a very good uh, tour, and it happens at the beginning of March. You'll see more advertised on that. And finally, uh, let's get started with a, a couple quick questions. Everybody asks, can I get this video? Uh, and is it going to be recorded? The answer is yes, you can get it. Join our online office. It's free for seven days. You can download whatever you like. And um, otherwise, join as a year because all these webinars are recorded. Next webinar for Michael Ballet will be on January the 6th. So this is just the first of four. And the four webinars are self-development, coach and develop others, look at supporting daily Kaizen, and finally Hoshin Conry. So Michael will be talking about all of that. Michael, I think you're going to be up now and talking a little bit about your background, where you've come from, and let everybody know that you're the Gemba coach. I love that, the Gemba coach and uh, what you've done over the years. Uh, and let's get started, Michael. Thank you. Well, thank you, George. Uh, actually, the, I'd like first to, to say thanks to Jeff Leiker, because you've been, a, I've been very fortunate to have him as a mentor, as well as Van Jones. And, and the whole cycle of seminars that we're doing is on, on your, your and, and Jeff Slater's book, uh, which, which, uh, which I really loved. So this is how this came about. Um, yes, I, I've been, for my sins, uh, I've been studying lean for 20 years now. It's kind of a get a life thing. Um, and and uh, for the past 10 years, I've been working with CEOs to try to help them and actually study as well uh, what it means to start a, a lean culture in your company. So this is not so much from the lean program side of things, but, but a lean as a business strategy. Uh, this is a journey that started with uh, my father, who, who discovered Toyota back in 1975, and um, who has, uh, as, as a CEO himself, learned and supplied to Toyota. He was an automotive CEO, learned from Toyota, from one of their top senseis. So many years ago, I was a professor, and he was retiring, and we decided to start consulting together and to try to teach people the way he'd been taught. Uh, the result of that was a series of books. The first is The Gold Mine, and The Gold Mine, that, that's the green book on your screen, and The Gold Mine is pretty much uh, getting into, getting to grips with lean and getting in there through the tool, and I'll talk about this more today. Then we wrote a second book called The Lean Manager, which is about seeing lean as a full system, and, and, then, um, and, then, and then finally we just came up with the third book on this lean journey, which is called Lead with Respect, which is a book that goes more into the depth of, of uh, what are the um, the what really the deep thing is that we learn through the first two books. So before we start, um, this is a, qu a question that there's so many debates about what is lean, what is not lean, what is TPS, what is all these things. Uh, I wanted to clarify that for me, lean remains a conversation with Toyota. The term lean first came when uh, a team of MIT researchers uh, looked at the entire automotive industry, oh, we're, what, 25 years ago or something like that now, and they found that Toyota was just a superior performance in all, all respects. Everything was different. 
And they, they started codifying this method. They looked for a term for it and they called it lean. Um, many people now tell me that we should outgrow Toyota, we should, uh, lean has become its own movement, and I'm still not sure. I, I do believe that profoundly Toyota went um, in the 1950s, discover something else, something different from the management we're all being taught with uh, managed by numbers and all these things, and, uh, and they've invented something just radically different, and it, it's very radical, and uh, I think Jeff, Jeff really captured this with the Toyota way and all his books on the Toyota way. And I, I don't see lean as different from the Toyota way. To me, to me, lean is a conversation with Toyota outside of the automotive industry, outside of Toyota. And and the question and, and the question we keep asking ourselves is what, what do these ideas mean in healthcare, in research, in high-tech companies? And this is what we're going to talk about today. So One thing, Michael. Um, I, I just want to let the group know. If they have any questions, they should uh, chat with Steve Dokus. Steve is one of our panelists. Steve, if you take yourself off mute when they have questions. We don't want to interrupt uh, Michael too much, but um, I think he'll pause a couple times in the next half hour. So thank I, you, Michael. No problem. The, 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 the big puzzle when you study, when you work with CEOs, and the big puzzle I've been working on for the past 15 years or so, which is a long time, is why aren't they more lean companies around? I mean, I mean, the, the results I've witnessed myself um, are something like uh, in about three years, which is very, very quick in, in company terms, is something like 50% uh, more sales, uh, double the margin, uh, divide the inventory by two, that's actually pretty frequent. Um, this company value multiplied by three, here I'm talking about a 1 billion uh, euro company. It's very impressive in four years. And employee satisfaction rises. I mean, we, we don't necessarily have all these results together. I mean, there's no magic wand, but but these are results I've seen in, in companies. And, and basically, lean, driven by the CEO, always works. So one of the biggest puzzles is that why don't we have more lean companies around? And this question has been coming around and running still here for the years. We do have some. Every year we have new new, new cases. But, but this remains uh, on a one-by-one -one basis. And, and so really we, we should, because uh, at the end of the day, and this is one of the rare numbers we have, if we look at a panel of just lean manufacturing, just people doing lean manufacturing, and these guys found uh, on, an, on an index of 800 manufacturers, 40% increase of profitability. So, so the question is, uh, why not people more doing it? The second question we have is, is Toyota relevant? And here you see the Toyota's growth, and this to me was always what caught me and, 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 and really fascinated me. We're, I mean, we're talking about totally saturated market. Uh, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler were very aggressive, very sharp, very hardworking competitors. They completely dominated the world markets. And in this complete saturated market, you can see Toyota's cur growth curve, uh, first in Japan and then across the world, which is astounding. And I think this is why Toyota is so relevant for us today, because this is the 21st century and all our markets are saturated. Everything, there's a competitor, everything. And even the companies that are, we hear so much about, um, they, they, they seldom were first. Somebody tried before, they were better. So Toyota has, profound lessons for any company now, because this is not about equipment. This is not about flogging stuff to people for them to buy. This is about facing really tough competition and, and how do you gain market share in a saturated market? It, it almost seems though, Michael, like, listen, Toyota must have uh, either thought the strategy out. We're all talking about Toyota. If I was in the automotive world, I'd want to work for Toyota just because because, hey, I know I want to be a group leader. That's, that's where the action is. So, I mean, does that not help as well? Like the fact that they're now known for this and everybody wants to emulate them? I, I, I actually think it's the other way around. I think, I think it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, anyway, I think it's the, 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 one of the biggest difficulties we have in the lean movement is I'm not sure we, we correctly interpreted their success. And I'd like to go back to the first book, Machine That Changed the World. 
And when when really we have this very large academic study of what happened, and what what did they tell us about some of that? Well, they tell us that first it's about engineering. It's uh, first a very strange strategy of full range variety, huge variety. And where there are competitors are retreated, retreated, left the low end markets, left the non profitable models to Toyota. Toyota kept expanding the brand all the way to Lexus, all the way to pickup cars, tool drop, all the way. They, 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 they hounded their competition through a very high variety. And this is probably the most astounding thing you see in Japan. I'll come back to this is, is the variety on the same line. The second thing that they did and that has changed the industry was faster new product introduction. The, the new products from Toyota just came faster and faster and faster. And in this way, they, they were a pioneer in something that we know now with all the GAFA companies, Apple with their regular introduction of new products, all the Google with all the changes, all these things. And they probably were the first guys to, to actually force a pace of product introduction that was just that much faster from the rest of the industry. The, the third thing that we see back in the day is clearly more value per product. I mean, the, they, they tried to come to the States with a, a car that was a Toyota pet. Uh, it got laughed out of the market. It was under, the engine was too small. It couldn't get on the highway or anything. And, but when they came back, um, I, I have the, I remember reading the text at the time and that it, the American engineers immediately saw the problem. They started panicking because there was so much more value in each product than they could offer. And, and this value is paid for something that people actually don't know about it. You have to, to visit many Toyota plants to start seeing it, which is radically better use of capital. If there was something that was astounding by Toyota is the use of capital is, when you see the diversity of products on one same line and the intensity of work there and how small and, and, and compact everything is, you, you, you can immediately see there's a, a completely different industrial model there. So to sum this up, what is a, what makes a lean company lean? I mean, that's a question. Well, the lean company is, it has more new products, less cost of defect, and, and this comes straight out of the margin, defects just straight out of the margin, so it's more profitable. It has more cash out of the inventory. It has less cap capital expenditure, and again, this is striking when you see Toyota. Um, it has less needless spending. I mean, you know, the, the, you know the, the warehouse you don't need because you, you think that having a more um, inventory or finished product will help you deliver more and all these Silly thing, the, the ERP upgrade, all the things people do. And there's more trust because you achieve these results by working with people, not against or you, you do something with them. You don't do something to them. So on the whole, there's something higher, more sustainable profitability. Um, where is the catch? I mean, why, why isn't everybody crazy about this? And th this is their, the biggest puzzle. And uh, I think Jeff has the answer. I think Jeff found the answer. And the answer is in Jeff's cycles, the, the, the hard thing, there, there's a hard, um, you have to step in the door. The, the door is narrow, it's not for everyone, because it starts with developing yourself before you develop others. And that is so hard for senior executives to grasp. They, they just want to get it done. They want to find somebody who's going to do it to their company. They want to delegate this. They want to do it this to people. And it's very hard to grasp the fact that they have to do it to themselves first. So I think, I think Jeff was really a visionary. I think he was, uh, I think this is things he picked up from uh, Akio Toyota here we see on the picture and with Jeff and, and this four step model, I'm, I'm very impressed and very grateful for Jeff to have written this. I mean, this has opened so many, answered so many questions we all had and had for a long time. So here on the first step is how do we go through one by one self-development topic? Now, the big thing for a CEO, and I work with these guys every day um, on the Gemba, the, 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 the first really tough thing is you have to change your mind on things. Like the first thing you have to change your mind is don't solve the problem yourself. As a CEO, you feel that now that's, that's next to impossible for some people, right? <laughs> It's, it's a matter of changing your, uh, I don't know, it's, I think they don't see it. I think it's, it, you, the, th the thing is that they think that uh, being a, uh, an executive means you come up with a plan that's going to radically change everything. 
and then you set up the structure and systems that will execute it. I mean, this is pure 19th century thinking. This is von Clausewitz. This is looking at markets like France and having a strategy and putting the logistics and executing the strategy. Uh, this is what you hear from consultants still today, and consultancies are probably still today amazingly the most hierarchical, uh, conservative uh, organizations around them, and they advise others, and this is what they have in mind. And the big change is here is that you learn through practicing problem solving every day, through repeated action, one by one, and you actually discover you don't know what you're going to find. It's through repeating the problem solving that the problem clarifies itself and you start understanding the larger sounds. Let me take you through an example. Here's a, a machine, it's not a very sexy machine, but it's a, a gasoline dispenser. Um, when, when we started asking these things, as you can see at the beginning of the curve, the, the sales were going down. It's a completely saturating, hyper-competitive market. And, and basically we, we thought, you know, we had to protect the market share and that's it. Um, that was the strategy thinking is like, we need to develop service and all the things, but the machines themselves won't sell. As, the curve you see here is the growth of, of unit sales. Um, as you can see, well, we all experienced a <clears throat> little hiccup in 2009. I'm sure you were familiar with it, but, but, but you see this, this, this global trend. And on the whole, what, what this corresponds to is a 50% is plus growth of market share, which is amazing. And, and roughly twice the EBIT. Now, how did that happen? Well, back in the factory, we, we, there was the tenant, you know, competitors were reducing options, but the strategy of the CEO was said, no, we need the options. Uh, we're making all these machines in two factories and we need to sell them all over the world, different regulations, different needs, so we have to keep the variety. But in order to make it more efficient, we wanted to get to flow. We have this obsession. Now, here what you see is the outcome. We have a next flow line. What we sorted, uh, started was a mess. There were machines all over the place. We, everybody thought it was it being possible to get to flow because of the variety. And actually, what we found out is that the first problem we had to solve was quality. Um, there were so many problems with machines that you, you tended to put them aside, and there's, um, there were buffers all over the place. So the first thing we worked on was uh, built-in quality. Now, we started from customer complaints. We actually went from the, the final bench and broke it down at every step of the process to check. And we worked it all the way back through engineering. And we started having this uh, value analysis, value engineering discussion, which is basically on the shop floor, we, we did a lot, of, a lot of Kaizen with the operators. So this is what you see is autonomous, autonomous Kaizen by operators. There's one team, there's one board, there's one board per team. And, and ongoingly, they take one topic after the other. When they finish one, they start the other one. But interestingly, we, oops, where is this? Um, we, 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 all this goes back all the way to engineering. And so the big self-development topic here is the radical change of thinking we had to do is to say, okay, we used to think products are, the products and services were good enough and the problem was sales. We need to sell harder and market better and so forth. We had to radically change our mind. Say, no, 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 products are never good enough. We need to offer more quality, more variety, and keep the price reasonable. So we need to change something in the way we're doing, um, rather than change the sales tactics. So here's what happens at the final control. In 2001, we're looking at defects per machine. In 2000, then in 2000, sorry, in 2008, in 2009, we're looking at defects per 100 machines. And moving from defects per 100 machines in 2011, we're looking at defects per 1,000 machines. So you can see that the quality strategy in terms of stopping the defects within the process, I mean, delivered incredible results at the, at the, at the final control. Now, on, on quality, how, how, did you, how did you do that, Michael? Like, did you focus with a specific problem-solving approach like Toyota business practices, or did, was it autonomous work teams kind of figuring out, you know, the where to point a cause? I mean, any formal training on that? 
Uh, uh, um, this was a real company, <laughs> George. It was far more messy than that. Uh, that's what I would hope you'd say. You know what? I'm glad. As long as that's the standard, I'm doing well. Yeah, exactly. It was mostly, oh, the biggest problem with the problem solving is not problem solving. This is fine. It's problem facing and then problem framing, <laughs> which means that people have to first admit they have a problem. And then they have to to angle it right. Problem solving has never been a problem. I mean, engineers are pretty smart and operators are pretty smart. They, they will solve problems. We had endless fights in the factory to admit we needed to have this continuous improvement. And and you know, the, the big, big, big thing was that usually people think there are some problems customers will live with. It's okay, they've always lived with we it's too difficult or costly to tackle this. And we changed that. The first thing that they, the guy who was in charge of the business unit, he, he retired now. And then, but the first thing he did is created a website to have every single complaint on it, to have good data on the quality from the customers. And then we we argued and struggled. And, and the important thing here is we moved it away from the production and into engineering and back into production. So really it's like value analysis. We, we What problems can we solve in production from engineering? And, and this had an unexpected result, which is a beautiful result, is, is here. Um, at some point, we started looking at the machine and saying, okay, what's a dispenser? What really is a dispenser? We started looking at the, the architecture for the machine. And we concluded that this machine was in fact a pump and a measure and a meter. And we looked at the meter and we realized that a hydraulics department that people had retired and left and died and there was nobody left. So the business unit manager, I mean, was very brave here. He rebuilt an entire hydraulics uh, department from scratch with the idea that he wanted a better meter. And this is what they did. I mean, they did something when you see the, the problem with meters is that they drift. Um, for gas stations, there's a huge problem. And here, the red curve, this is the meter they came up with. So here you see the value engineering. So this is really the core lesson. I mean, I'm talking back back in the early 90s or late 80s that the core lesson we forgot for looking at Toyota, which was the value analysis, which is solving problems in production, leads us to radical innovation in engineering. So here we have the value engineering. Um, because we're so focused on looking at all these problems, this is what happened. And, and the interesting case here is that we never actually look to productivity. Um, it just kind of, a, a from looking at all the details and solving all the problems, this is what came up. And again here, so we're looking at improvement in production. But the interesting thing is this curve, which is the corresponding improvement in engineering. So remember, we have high variety, we're fixing quality. And in the process, uh, because engineering is so focused on the machine and, and on the details, the work content per machine goes down radically. So here, here this is real productivity. This is not just shuffle productivity. This is productivity built into the machine, and we're back to better use of capital. Am, am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I, I don't know. Do you, do you see how impressive this is? I mean, thirty percent reduction of work content in five years. This, this is yeah, 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 and it's consistent. I mean, I, I don't see a hiccup here. This is like consistently dropping, so it's it's very nice. Why don't we open it up for a couple of questions? Uh, anybody that's a panelist, please take yourself off mute and ask a question if you like at this stage. Yes, um, Michael Johan Kutsuria from um, South Africa. Maybe just a quick comment on that. I found in some of the lean implementations that we've done that the um, the whole focus of the lean implementation seems to gravitate towards labor um, productivity type of gains, and it it all it misses the whole point of problem solving to look for the root causes for the labor um, or the productivity issues. Uh, maybe some comments on that from your side. Oh, you know, because because we discovered Link from the factory, I mean, we missed the point. I was, I was very fortunate because I was told by my father, he was a CEO, and to him, he'd solved the factory problems a long time ago. His problems were engineering. The problem is selling more products, more variety, better quality. So um, from the start, we were focused on, on, on getting the product right. And it, it's not even a, again, 
I, I'm one of the guys who brought the attention on, on the focus on, on problem solving, and I felt somewhat guilty about it. You know, before, it, Lean was all about flow, and it, it's great. And then it, we, we saw that when you accelerate flow, you also reveal problems, so you have to solve problems. But we still, I think, for my part, missing the point. The point is the passion for the product. We've got to love the product, even if it's a gasoline dispenser or whatever the product is. We we need to be absolutely passionate because because this this is where this is where the rubber meets the road. It's all about, about the product. And and to me, the, the the lesson here is neither labor productivity. Neither, I'll come back to this. Neither um, problem solving, but actually understanding what do customers prefer. How do we fix the value analysis of products already in production? How we draw the lessons in engineering for the next generation of products? So it, it, the question, that, one of the things I, I've tried to do and <laughs> often fail is how do you bring back, how do we bring back product into lean thinking? It, it really is how do we somehow get production and engineering working together to make better products? And basically, one of the big mental changes we have here, and this is another self-development topic for, for executives, is we come from a generation of, we've been brought up with Taylorism. We, we, with, uh, we had Taylorism in our bottles and with this idea that the standard results come from uh, standard processes. And of course, people are always a problem because we are clear that the process should work if people would only just follow the process. Uh, and that is that is um, 20th century thinking. This is how if you're Coca-Cola and you have you can conquer the world, or if you have invented nylon, you protect your innovation, you put in standard processes, and you can cookie cutter it across the world. But we're now in the 21st century, and this is a saturated world. And the lean thinking here is completely different. No process is ever perfect. People are the solution; they're not the problem. Because in order to care for customers, in, or, in order to, to be flexible for customers, you can't do it without engaging people. They will come up with the extra effort, energy, creativity, and courage to do so. So this is a radical change of thinking here for, for executives. They have to start stop thinking that people are the problem because if only they would follow the cookie cutter process everywhere and start seeing that people are the solution and the process is always a problem. Hey, Michael, on that note, if you go back to that previous slide, I mean, I could really use um, a hint here. If somebody's so stuck in the red, how do you get them to the green when their entire paradigm is, is um, in jeopardy of being affected here? And it's... For you showed some the executives. Facts, which is this slide, and this is one of the oldest slides that I had from Toyota. It told me, well, listen, uh, let's be reasonable about this. Uh, every product has a core uh, kernel of cost. There's a, there's a, like the nut in the fruit. Um, you buy your raw materials on the markets. It's certain trade. You, you pay your people locally. It has a certain, you pay them a certain rate. Um, there is a, there's a kernel of truth. But on top of this, your production methods um, add cost. There's a cost of your mistakes. Uh, very recently, I was I was discussing with the guy CEO's company was just build, building a, a two two million euros a warehouse to have more uh, finished products because he thinks that he needs to deliver better to his customer and he's convinced that by having more finished products in the warehouse he will deliver better and say say hey hey yeah, why why are you adding all this cost to every product uh, rather than that improve your flexibility and that really really oh, think about. Think about all the things that management does. Here's a challenge to anybody who's in management. Uh, uh, please look at me in the eye and tell me that in the past couple of years, you have not done a $1 million mistake. A huge consultancy contract and you don't see the end of it. Um, um, ERP upgrade, uh, and, and it, uh, uh, standardization approach. Some. some Everybody does something silly. Uh, supply chain redesign, all these things. Now, the lean core idea is, as opposed to Taylorism, Taylorism was about making people work. Taylor's idea was that people were lazy and would soldier on and loaf. So if you define the process, you'd have them work. Toyota worried about something completely different. They thought as they grew and you saw the growth curve, 
it will catch big company disease. Big company disease means that you forget about your customers and you start worrying about your processes and systems and structure and you add on cost and you add on cost and you add on cost. And, and managers refuse to see this because they consider these are exceptional costs. But as in so many cases, let, let, let's just imagine that you start your operation in China, something I've seen many times, and you completely ignore that nothing works and you have to send your engineers every other weekend to China. On, you know, you have to fly them all over the place. So you don't have enough engineers left at home, creates a lot of problems. The engineers are always flying there. The overcosts are enormous. So the whole starting point for lean thinking and for self-development to break that mentality of the slide of the previous slide, the whole starting point is the realization of these overcosts. And when they start hitting you in the face, you start using these other costs to discover your own misconceptions. And to my mind, this is what lean thinking is about. The, the first 20 pages of Taishi Ono's first books are about misconceptions, discovering the mistakes you make that add unnecessary costs to the product. So to do so, we have a number of practices which are self-development practices. You don't need anybody. You don't need to have a, a, a lean office or you, you just this, these are things that you do yourself as an executive <laughs> you just have to you know the, the, you practice the practices I mean it's like uh you know Tai Chi um as, as, I don't know who came up with the sentence you practice your Tai Chi Ono and the first practice of course is you you go to the game but you go to the game but to see facts that they're a source you don't read reports and read numbers. You want to you want to have a real occurrence and you talk to the people. And, and the key thing here is that you get people to agree on a problem before they jump to solutions. Most of the conflict I see in companies are people arguing about solutions when they don't agree with the problems. How, how can they ever agree? Now, here's back to the tools, and the tools are very important. The, the tools will not solve any of your problems. Well, the tools are wonderful standardized method to see the problem. So people tend to get this one backward. But first, you when you have a any query, you use a Kaizen tool. You, you go somewhere and, and do it yourself or ask somebody to do this. And you use the tool like 5S or, or, or leveling, and immediately the waste will appear. It will the, because it's gonna be, because it's gonna, the tool is gonna show the waste which will show the ways to improvement. So you will start seeing the improvement. Um, what people tend to do the, is the other way around is they want the improvement, they look at the waste and they want a tool to take the waste out. That, that never works. We have to see this as a self-development. I want to understand my improvement opportunity. In order to do this, I will practice a Kaizen tool. I will discover the mood I am generating, which will lead me to see the improvement that I can have. So well, that's the first practice. The second practice, uh, to me, this is what um, distinguishes Lingard from everybody else, is you just calculate attack time. And you don't have to be very precise about it. Sometimes it's, it doesn't fit very well. But if you ask yourself, what are, what are the products I'm getting through the same value stream? And what is attack time? It's this graph that you see here. You have a global tag time, but then you have a tag time for car A, car B, car C. And this immediately dimensions your capacity. Immediately you see the requirements. If, if instead of uh, writing a book, if people ask me, uh, you know, uh, how many books do you write by decade or something like that, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, what I'll say is I try to write a book every two or three years, I have a tag time. Immediately, it, 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 it says my, my effort. Immediately, I can see the capacity. And I'm a writer, so I don't only write lean books. I write lots of all the stuff. I write a Gimba Coach column, which comes every week. I write um, articles that I do about once a month. I do, I do other things. I write uh, novels and poetry, all these stuff. And how it all fills together? Well, through tech time. And uh, through tag time, I can pace my capacity and see what I can do what I can't do. So tag time is absolutely essential to turn work into physical deliverables that we can understand what we need to do. The third practice is brutal. You go to after sales. Nobody ever takes care of that. Today. The after sales guy are not even in the same building. Nobody ever talks to them. And the first thing, uh, it's, uh, this one is actually 
go to after sales and we look at every single customer complaint. Not to solve them, we, we can't, but to understand it, we need to understand the, the, the like, as they told me, the, the, the Toyota guy said, the buzz of the problems. The, before the problem must flower, there's a bud of the problem. We need to understand this. And what we discover is that between what customers ask for, what they really use, what we want to do, and what others want us to do, is never the same thing. Completely different things. So, wow, this is a big area. So as we learned at PDCA, one complaint after the other, as we do, you know, how do we fix this? Let's try it, check it, what conclusions? Um, it doesn't solve all the company's problems at all, but as a self-development exercise, it's wonderful. We learn so much about the products. And again, this is what, how we started with the dispensers, and this is where we started is the, 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 the complaints and the after sales. And again, we're not saying to solve, we don't think that by solving every problem is going to be perfect, not at all. Every problem we'll look at will teach us something about the problem. Which brings us immediately to the practice number four, which is you go back to the line, which we did with the dispenser that you saw, and you start to stop and, and look at every defect. And at first you can't, so you put in red bins, you put in breaks in the analysis, uh, uh, control breaks in the flow, and you do all this until you're finally doing this at one piece low. Now, the beauty of one piece flow, and this is one thing as a system, is that if you see one piece, if you produce one piece flow, you can solve problems one at a time because you look at products one at a time. And here, the big thing is uh, you turn it around and it, it all hinges on having a team, a team leader, and looking at every single defect and problem. Again, we don't necessarily know how to fix them all. But we will learn and we will find out. And, and suddenly, um, things that uh, are very complex for engineering are not so complex for operators. I mean, they, 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 they have, at that level, I mean, great insights. Not always right, but great insights, great ideas. And again, we bring production and engineering together. Which brings us to practice five, which is basically pull, 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 pull. Whenever you see a queue, whenever you see an invention, you just don't, don't ask questions. Just reduce it by half. Just cut it in half, cut it in half, see what happens. And every time you, you, you cut queues and you cut backlogs and you cut inventories, uh, you, will, you will see problems emerge and you will learn more. Again, this is, again, this is not about fixing your production. This is about learning about your process, learning about the policies you have that create these queues. Where do these queues come from? Why do we have inventory? And, and as, as you do this with executive, well, you learn. And sometimes you learn it's stuff. I mean, for instance, it's very frequent that if you have a machining, uh, the guys are quite happy to do SMED to reduce the changeovers, but they hate reducing batch sizes because it would mean that they have less, uh, less first, you know, they, the first part has to be a right part, which is technically more difficult. So all these things, there is not one, one approach. You, you, you cut the inventory, you cut the queues, and you see what you hit, and what you hit is always surprising, and then you work with the guys to fix it. So basically what- Sorry, Michael. Yep. Mark, just a quick question on that one. Um, in a service organization where you have, uh, for instance, processing centers, uh, processing uh, financial transactions or account opening for a bank environment, for instance, um, obviously inventory is a little bit hidden there, especially if it's inside a system. Um, a workflow system, um, would uh, maybe getting rid of cherry picking in the workflow um, also um, visualize or put some of those uh, problems up in the top? Well, I, the, the trick is on the slide here, and uh, here is here is the, the, nut, the nut of the problem in terms of self-development. How do we teach senior execs to get the hang of Kanban? Um, Kanban is not just on machine presses. Kanban works with engineering projects, with office environments. Kanban is about visualizing the waiting queue and understanding that on one person's desk, you can have more than, let's say, two, three, maximum four things open at the same time. Kanban is on vi it's about visualizing the flow work to make sure that people work on the right thing at the right time. So, so Kanban is not just using Kanban for a... Um, steel pressing press. Kanban is, is a knack. 
is a way to visualize exactly what you were saying. Exactly. You have to learn it. You have to learn it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of tradition here. So you often have to learn it with a sensei because you, many of these things you don't invent yourself. But the biggest thing in terms of self-development for the executive is to convince them that uh, getting the hang of Kanban themselves uh, will make a difference. And one of the thing, key things you see, uh, which is always surprising, and we saw for many years, people who went to Japan or everywhere around the world for suppliers to Toyota, uh, one thing that was always funny and that astounded us was that the CEOs, and I'm talking CEOs, of a company working for Toyota as a supplier, uh, doing Lean for Real, would explain to us the Kanban. And one of the things I'm very proud of is that, that this, the CEOs I work with uh, you can go to their plants, you can go to their engineering office, you can go to their fact, to their companies, and they will, will explain the Kanban. The Kanban is what exact, it responds, it visualizes exactly what you're saying. And when the work is hidden in the computer, how do you get it out? Uh, and the, looking at it one by one, uh, gets into uh, one of the six practices is usually a standardized work. Well, actually, it's, it's, standard, it's not work the same everywhere at all. It's the fact that every operator should have a very smooth flow uh, of movement. It should be very natural. It should be like, like putting, you know, seeding a field. It should be a, a completely smooth flow. And if you're looking at the office environment, it's crazy because they have these, these screens with these incredibly small lines and they keep going back and forth and back and change the screen. and retype, rework, all these things, and you and you see it, it's even it's even more visual, it's even more striking in a in an office environment. So you have this idea that the person should be able to do the work seamlessly. And you see that. And this is some development, you learn to see this everywhere. And you learn to see where the person hits the barrier. And then you learn Kaizen, which is as the person, hey guys, you know, what can we do? You just what can we do? We want to work as I understand again. For instance, one thing, people misunderstand 5S a lot. They think it's about cleaning the factory. Not at all. 5S is about giving the operator an autonomous method to reach standardized work. Uh, they will learn to organize themselves, their work areas, and this works perfectly in office because they've been taught 5S so that they can work seamlessly. This is not at all about something you impose to have a clean environment. This is not, a, you know, this is not about taking the picture of the wife and kids away from the desk because it has to be 5S. This is horrible stuff consultants do. No, 5S is you teach every person to organize themselves in, in, in a way that they can work seamlessly uh, through every task. Which brings us to the seventh practice, which, which is where I, we probably should start with this, which is where it's absolutely wonderful is that when people have suggestions, you learn from this. So the photo here you see is a guy had to have a very long uh, thing to screw in here. And all they did is that they put a, an attachment to the uh, drill so that you could do it mechanically. This is the level of suggestion we're looking for. But the trick is, as an executive, is you learn from this. You, you pay a lot of attention to this because it's not just to make people feel good about themselves. Uh, recognition is always good, obviously. But there's far more to this because uh, when, when people locally solve an issue, they don't always see the bigger challenge. And, and I've had so many cases where people have solved the bigger, uh, very small issues and they believe for themselves and we re reward, recognize all these things. But after we walk out of the, uh, we walk out of the room and, and afterwards we say, oh, wow, did you see that? Because as, as an executive, the implications could be completely radically different. And this is where it gets really fun. So that's the toughest lesson. The toughest lesson is that it has to be inclusive learning. Uh, this is not a cookie cutter approach. This is an organic approach. And that as, as, you, as you, your development and their development is the same, you, you, you need to develop yourself. You ask questions, people answer, and their answer means that you have different answers as well and more questions and so on. So, so it, it's really the cycle of they learn, you learn. And, and well, the census from the start have been telling us how to do this. I mean, they say basically this is uh, one guy in the States, a uh, Toyota guy says, uh, think deeply, think deeply, always. Try immediately something, do small steps, do very small steps, and always start thinking, what's next? 
usually, you know, people made an improvement and they're very happy made an improvement and I think that's it. And, and, and it's, no, you need to, the Kaizen spirit, you need to continue. What's next? What next? What next? So what? What next? So what? And so forth. And the aim of this practice is thinking deep. And this is very disturbing. We act our way into thinking. We don't think our way into acting. So here, here and to, to finish, this is the biggest mistake I ever made. Uh, I was studying this back in 1993, and I was doing my dissertation work on this, and I saw the Toyota consultant come to one of us, do this incredible thing in the line. And at the time, we all thought the same. I think the entire uh, lean consultant industry was born on the dream that because we had these spectacular results, if we could just replicate it across the plant and across all plants, it would be wonderful. Of course, it never worked. 20 years later, people still try. They still try and it still doesn't work. But somewhere in some places with some CEOs, it works spectacularly. And then I realized uh, because I was not seeing the full picture, this was the full picture. The critical guy here is the site manager, of course. The site manager works with the CEO. The CEO works with the sensei. The sensei works with the coach. And all these guys works with the team. So what really we discovered, and I, I realized that what happened to my dad and his plans, is the reason the sensei is sent a coach to teach the guys here is because he, let me see what the pointer, do you see the pointer guys? Yeah. <laughs> I so, think here, let me click. <laughs> oh, I see your pointer, go ahead. I was gonna do the same thing. So here, here it is, the, 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 the reason the sensei sent this guy to work with these guys is because he needed to teach this guy and this guy. So we needed rapid improvement, not because one cell would change, would save the factory or the, or the company, would never did. But uh, believe me, every time this guy changes his mind, the entire company changes. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, got, we got a similar problem. <laughs> so your dad, your dad was this guy here, am I right? This guy here. Tom. Oh, this is your dad. This is your dad. He was a CEO. Yeah. And he discovered through working with Toyota, the only thing that mattered to him was how good his site managers and his engineering managers were. Right. And that in order to teach them, they needed to rapid improvement here in the cells. So we had this setup that the coach had to move the cell quickly to teach these two guys, and the sensei was making sure that. So that was the setup. And, and this, when I started doing the research, I, I realized this. I realized this, and I realized that the way Lean developed in Toyota, and Jeff really was very helpful there, was it developed internally through the line, through, through Taishi Ono gaining rank and rank and rank, spreading it, spreading it internally because he had more clout. And then at some point, they realized their limits were suppliers. So they started sp spreading it through the supplier CEOs. So really, the, this, this, the way lean spread, TPS spread in Japan around Toyota is really through the top, not through consulting and Kaizen and Kaizen Blitz. The almost surprising thing about Japan is that when you, when you go there, you can see exactly the same spread. Last time we were there, were the same spread of companies like we can see in France, not everybody's doing lean or TPS, only people in the Toyota area. The other companies are just like any other company here. And, and this is what, what uh, in, in uh, Jeff's uh, book, what Accio Toyota says in, in, the, in the forward, it says, our goal is for every Toyota mem team member from the work on production floor to our most senior executive to be working continuously to improve themselves. So we all need sensei who will guide us uh, to the next level of achievement. And I personally have many sensei teachings. And the trick here, so to answer the puzzle at the beginning, why are there so few lean companies? Well, the thing is, there is no such thing as a lean enterprise or a lean company. And, you know, you, when the, the, the guy of the dispensers who did all this with the dispensers retired. And I'll leave you with a, a, a question mark, an open question about what happens afterwards. Because this is the answer to the first question. The, it's not a system. It's, it's, a way, it's a way of doing your business. And the entry fee that you have to, to pay to buy into Lean is 
you is the self development. You you have to develop yourself to develop. I, I, I thought you were going to say your your soul. You got to give your soul. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, come on, this is not a religion. I mean, this is just a method. It's just method. But but the point is that it's hard. Is there's no religion here. It's just that you, as an executive, cannot delegate this any more than you can delegate learning or going to the bathroom. You can't have somebody else do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Well, and they say lean starts in the washroom sometimes. Like that's what Paul like. You got to scrub the floors. <laughs> Because ultimately, uh, Kaizen can only happen within a relationship, and the results will only happen as a, as, as a re within the relationship. So, so this is the ultimate aim of what we do with Lean: is that the business it's a completely different uh, approach to business because gr business growth cannot be separated from human growth. In the 20th century, we extracted value from people. We we modern times. It was visionary. Charlie Chaplin's modern times is visionary. This is what we did in the 20th century. But, but we're not in the 20th century anymore. We're in a saturated market with uh, highly educated workforces and rapid technology change. It's all moving so fast. Right now, we need to completely change our mind and to grow a different way, which is that the, the way we grow the business is through growing every person in the business. So that's it for me, guys. Uh, Michael, we do have a question that says leaders are in meetings, answering emails. So how do we get our leaders back to looking and seeing what they need to do? And then the question would be is that you need a sensei, but where do you get a sensei? Or how do you create a sensei? Uh, Steve, uh, if I had an answer to that question, if anybody finds the answer to that question, please send it to me. I write a book. <laughs> Maybe I'll sell a few copies. Um, I want to publish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't think there's an answer to this question, but again, because again, back to this entire seminar, lean is a leadership self-development journey. And and if you think you think lean is like kung fu, you know, you, you have moves that you practice again and again. So how do you do? You read the book, and all the guys I worked with, it's the same story. They read the book. And then they go to the conference, you know, they go to do the practice of Tai Chi in the park. And then they go to the small group. And then they talk to the instructor, say, I need private tuition. And then somebody, the instructor says, sorry, I'm not good enough anymore. You need to go climb up the mountain and see the master who taught me, you know. So there is no way you can get somebody to do this. This is a, it has to come from them. It's a journey. It's a learning journey. It's a self-development journey. Now the second difference, so so this is already rare. I mean, you didn't, you don't get to be a senior executive by self-developing. You get to be a senior executive by being having very good survival skills, mostly. <laughs> good point. So, good point. <laughs> some of these guys, but some of the older guys I work with are, are just they, they just love their products and they, and they want to do the best for the company. So they are on this journey already. Then you have to find a, a, a Pat Lancaster from, from the Lean Thinking book. Pat Lancaster told me this 20 years ago. Literally, he said, when I said, okay, what's the secret? I was researching this. I said, what's the secret? He says, that's easy. You start from the top. You find a sensor you can work with, and you drive it through the line on the Gamba. And so the second part of the problem is finding the sensor, and, and that is part of the journey because senseis are, senseis are difficult. They're rare. They're expensive. They're often a pain in the ass. And, and and you have to find one you can work with. But finding the sensei is not, again, you can't buy them in a supermarket. All the stories you will read, if you remember lean thinking, is that the CEO had to beg the sensei to come and help. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is, guys, this is about being competitive. You know, this is not about being just okay. If you want to be just okay, please go for operational excellence or world-class manufacturing or a Lean Six Sigma or, I don't know, military music and all this stuff. Um, this is about being more competitive. So it's not made for everybody. How hard do you want to try it? How hard do you want to work at being more competitive? How hard do you want to look for a sensei and convince them that, that you're worth developing. It's a different world. Well, uh, a follow on to that then, is that the reason that there's not many companies that are lean because you can't find those pieces of the puzzle? And then if you do find some of them, those people might move on to someplace else? 
Well, imagine, let's imagine the perfect lean implementation. You have a good sensei, you have a, you know, for me, senses, I count the degrees of separation with Taishi Ono. I'm taught by my father for my sins, uh, who was taught by Mr. Hayashi, who was taught, worked with Ono. So we're talking three degrees of separation. So somebody, a sensei has to be, has to carry a tradition. So you have to find a sensei, then you have to find a, a CEO motivated by learning. And then if it's a big company, you also have a good uh, leader for the lean program because it fits a, uh, after uh, six or eight, uh, seven hundred people, you need some pro a program of some sort. So uh, that's very simple. Look at the probabilities for the three things, multiply the probabilities, and see where you get to. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, let's open it up for any panelist. Uh, that includes you, Jerry, and Peter from Bueller Furniture or anybody else, any panelist that wants to take themselves off of mute, ask a question, and put themselves back on mute. Go ahead, guys. I guess a sensei question just kills it, doesn't it? You, you know, uh, here's what I'm going to do, Michael. You could be the first in the uh, supermarket, but I'm going to create a sensei supermarket <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> Click on your sensei contact. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, good luck with that. that it, sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like hurting cats. I don't know if you've met any of these guys, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to promote... Uh, here's some questions, but I'm going to promote a lot of people. Uh, Steve, go ahead and ask any more questions you have. That's all that I have right now. Hi, Michael. Uh, it's uh, Peter Porter. I have a question. What's your um, active sort of development step at this moment? Where you're focusing on for your sort of development? Uh, are, are you talking in terms of a company, a product development or my own uh, research? Your own uh, research. Uh, we're, um, I'm very, very fortunate because I get to, uh, I work with Dan Jones currently. And we're, um, uh, we've been asking ourselves the question, how come, you know, how come the lean movement is still here 20, 20 years ago? And how come it's still as frustrating as ever um, 20 years? Because we, we, we're in the same exact, when we have presentation, it's like we have not moved on from 20 years in terms of what companies do. And, and so we're looking back to, we're going back to machine that change the world. And we're starting to realize that we saw it as backwards because because of a because of, because where we first started was in production. But we're starting to realize that uh, that it's all about the product strategy. And and um, this is quite fascinating. We just wrote, wrote an article about the fact that lean is about learning to learn, and the different types of learning that we have, and in particularly what if you impose yourself a tact of new product every every new. Every time you have to discover what is it you have to learn. Now, also, if you have impose yourself a tag of new product, and you don't want to build a factory of product or a new line for product, you have to put this product on existing lines. So you have to flexibilize the existing uh, production facilities of our streams. So what we're looking at at the moment is, uh, with 20 years of hindsight, going back to uh, the original research of the 1990s, just before Toyota was about to expand globally and trying to figure out what brought them to that point, how, how, how they did it. And, and it's fascinating because it, it's uh, when you started from the product all the way down to manuf manufacturing, as opposed to starting from manufacturing and going to engineering, suddenly you see things very, very differently. Okay, thank you. Yeah, interesting. And that was Peter from Belgium. And if you're gonna if you're gonna ask a question, just let me know your name and what country you're from. So obviously Michael Ballet's from France, but go ahead, anybody else. Take yourself off that. mute. Well, Hi. you know, that's what we Hello? thought. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, this is Janneke from the Netherlands speaking. I have a question. Um, is it possible to start lean from the operations or from the floorings? Um uh, instead of uh, from the top? You can start doing from anywhere as long as you start with yourself. 
the question is always the same. <laughs> Come on, that's too politically correct. <laughs> No, no, afterwards, it, it, you, the, the thing is, you can't do lean to others. You have to accept this. You, have, you can do lean to yourself, and you can do lean to your teams. Then you can excel because you do lean and get promoted. And when you get to be the CEO, you can do lean to the company. Um, and the, the one thing that simply doesn't work, and no matter how hard people try, because believe me, they try very hard a lot, is doing lean to others. That is pure Taylorism. That was Taylor's idea that the engineer could come up with a perfect process and impose it on the workers and it will work. This is where lean is radically different. So anybody can start lean. Um, I started lean with, uh, I was, a, you know, I stopped teaching. I started doing consulting gigs. I was doing projects. And at some point I calculated tag time and I said, this is ridiculous. Consulting projects are ridiculous. We should, what we should really do is to have a, a lean Gemba visit every month, just the way my father was taught. And suddenly I leveled my loan, my load. And it was it was it was lean applied to consulting business. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it okay, uh, let me let me answer this way, Jenny. It's such thing as lean, this is lean thinking. Jim and Dan called it lean thinking. Lean thinking is a way to think, it's a way to look. And and when I'm with CEOs, it's it's funny because uh, we we then we we but then we we take trains and we take cars and we just sit there and sit in waiting rooms and we look around and we think lean about what we see and and the the Muda is just amazing. It's all over the place. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Charles Thomaset. He said, how do you explain Toyota's recent fiasco on defects and recalls? I think this is, this is a better question for Jeff because he studied it in detail. But what I understand from him is um, first, for, it's a complex thing. It's that first, there was no technical problem. There simply was not. And the conclusion for all this is that the, the, the big crisis that they had with the big recalls, they got caught in American gotcha politics, you know, you know, if you do business with uh, with the states, you make a lot of money. But eventually, this is experience of every French company making money in the states. Just, uh, <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> the, states, the states gives and the states takes it back. You get caught in some lawsuit and you have to pay the millions back. This is this is basically what happened to them. Um, the other part with a recall that you have to see is that Toyota Toyota is not a, a nicey nicey company either. I mean, they play hardball. And with these recalls, they're setting the bar very high for the rest of the industry. They've got the cash that they need to apply their own principles of Jidoka. So it's applying TPS to the letter. If you have some, something wrong, whatever it is, you just recall, restart. Now, uh, where this is uh, pretty competitive is that now look at the damage it did to GM recently when they discovered there was a problem with one of the products that didn't recall it. So uh, again, Toyota is setting the, the bar very hard. Um, I don't think there is any particular, uh, Toyota is still on the top of list of reliable cars day in, day out, year in, day, year out. Uh, Toyota has had an interesting, a couple of interesting years with uh, the Lehman Brothers, the Recall Crisis, the uh, Fukushima and then the the, the uh, innovation in Thailand, and now this is all sort of giving away. Look at the money they're making right now. So so it's still a cash machine. So uh, all this is it's is it, you have to distinguish what is a lean thinking and what is automotive. So it's a it, it's a mix of both. Exactly. So let me suggest there's about three webinars Jeff did just on the recalls and what that was all about, and that's in the online office if anybody wants to get a hold of it. Here's a question that somebody uh, put a chat in. What, how do you deal with the negativity uh, from the shop floor? If somebody's very negative towards lean. How do you, how do you deal with that, Michael? Hey, I, I have to say it, um, uh, I hasn't happened, let's touch wood, it hasn't happened to me a long time. Uh, I have more problems with negativity with uh, management uh, committee members. Uh, again, it's a, how do you go about it? I mean, I, I tend to work with the CEO. We go to the shop floor and we ask people to do Kaizen and we, 
we spend time just looking what they do. And usually when the CEO is here on the shop floor, nobody's being very negative. And if they are very negative, we're very interested. Can we listen? Because there's something we need to figure out. Um, so that's, that, that tends not to be a problem. What we do see as a problem is that uh, we do have department head. Here's what happens. Here's, here's the political dimension of lean. Um, when you do lean, you work with your line guys, you work with your head of production, you work with your head of engineering, your head of procurement, and the product flow. And, uh, and usually companies these days are run by the head of finance and the head of marketing and the head of IT and the head of HR. So CEOs who start doing lean suddenly change who they talk to. And I just had a funny case. This, this, recently I worked with some Italian chaps, they're absolutely wonderful. They've had great result with lean. Uh, they doubled their margin actually in service operations, and they're two brothers, they're the CEOs. And they were telling me that at some point that their finance director, who's a very nice guy, came and made a scene. He was very unhappy about something, and 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 they said, "What are you unhappy about?" And I said, "Well, you don't ever talk to me anymore." And they they realized that they've been doing lean for two or three years. And yes, before that, every every other month they were in a meeting with a finance guy and the HR guy of how do we cut costs one more time? And they started doing lean and they were working with the line guys and they were not talking to this guy who still had plenty of ideas of cutting costs and he, he just felt very bad because nobody was talking to him anymore. So they, this it was not very funny for him, unfortunately, but it made us laugh because this is this is a, the big political thing. Uh, a lot of people are there are there have a stake in the status quo. And lean is going to change the status quo. But if you have negativity at the shop floor level, at operator level, I find this very strange. It usually means that something else is going on. Okay, and, I don't know who asked the question, but you know, if they want to take themselves off mute, again, say their name, George from Canada, and then just ask a further question to that. Uh, anybody else, please go ahead. Okay, somebody's uh, um, asking about IT. So they're saying, you're not an IT guy. Dan Jones is not an IT guy. These are facts, apparently. <laughs> and why did you choose to write a book about IT? Uh, well, my, my first job was, um, was programming. Uh, I, I, for my sins, my very first job, I programmed uh, two things. I, I was supposed to program databases. I was not very good at it and programming uh, dynamic simulations, you know, the system thinking, I, I think, and so forth. And I think that um, IT is absolutely essential, um, essential. Uh, I'm not talking about ERPs, I'm talking about IT. I think, I think that when, when they were at steam engines, they would build factories around steam engines, electricity came in for a generation, they put electricity in steam, in steam factories. It took a generation for them to um, build factories around electricity. Now, our generation has been putting computers in traditional companies. And then I'm fascinated by Google, Amazon, Apple, and Facebook, because these are companies built around the computer. This is radical. Amazon is a search engine to which you put, you add warehouses and logistics and now drones and hands and captors, and, but it's a search engine and it's a company built around the search engine. So I'm absolutely des desperate to learn about IT. I, I do spend a lot of time with uh, Agile guys and Scrum guys and all these, all these chaps in IT. Um, and I, I really think big data is something we need to incorporate in products. Work with have embarked uh, software. There's no such thing as a pure product these days, and we and when they don't, we put some in. Uh, I'm thinking of one case of a product that we're we're started the startup to see how we put captors and thinking into the product. So um, I'm I'm definitely um, very keen on IT. Um, I'm also keen on ERPs, which is a completely different <laughs> topic. Well, and you know what? I was keen on an ERP system um, because I implemented. I don't know, several. <laughs> and then I thought I could make a living at it, and then I heard lean is coming. Uh, that was 20 years ago, and am I glad I made the switch. <laughs> but interesting. Uh, okay, any, any other questions on IT or anything else, who you are, where you're from, and ask the question. Go ahead, guys. 
Hi, it's Janneke from the Netherlands George. again. Oh, sorry? Yes, go oh, ahead. Yes. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Ballet, how do you cope with people focusing on the tools and techniques rather than on the philosophy or the way of thinking or well, how it's called? Yeah, again, I'm going to surprise you. I'm one of these tool and techniques guys. Uh, I, I, I really worry when people start, start to talk to me about philosophy. I, I see this as you, know, you study uh, Zen. Before you study Zen, you see the mountain as a mountain. Then you study Zen and you no longer see the mountain as a mountain. Then you, you get Zen and you see the mountain as a mountain. So I, I feel the same about tools and lean. It's like uh, when you start to first get into lean, it's all about the tools. Then you get to a strange place where it's all about the philosophy and whatnot. And then you get lean and it's all about the tools. So the question is, what does it mean, the tools? Um, there are people who look for the tools for answers. They want to fix the process. And they use a tool and they get an answer. And then they always are disappointed. Uh, for me, the tool is the way you get to ask the right question. So it's again, it's about an interaction with the guys on the floor. Is I use the tools to ask questions. And it, the, the big principle here is show, don't tell. The great thing about a tool is that you don't have to explain, you don't have to go into word, blah, 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 blah. You come up with a tool, you say, guys, this is what we're trying to do. Um, cut the cut the change over time in half or five is this area of this because we want to smooth the movement or whatever. You use a tool and the tool asks the question and then you listen to the answers. Um, some people use the tools because they think tools have the answers in them and they tend to be disappointed until you educate them and you show them that it's different. Um, uh, however, I'm very wary of people who like the lean philosophy, but are not ready to learn the tools. Uh, mostly they, they go into very strange places in their, in their mind there. There is an element of lean is not like architecture, it's like pottery, you know, you have to put, you have to turn the pots and turn the pots and turn the pots yeah. and turn the pots. And there's a uh, so so and and turning the body means using the tool. I mean that that that's how you do it, and that's how you learn. And over the 20 years I've been doing this, um, just take 5s. I I learn about things. I see things different about 5s almost every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting because uh, Jeff Jeff Liker said the same thing. He says at the end of the day, I never teach the tools. I teach the philosophy. That all said, you have to start with the tools. <laughs> kind of interesting philosophy. <laughs> uh, well, one other thing, I, I, I think it's probably a, an area of, uh, I don't think I, I'm disagreeing with Jeff, but one other thing I find out with, um, with the old timers is that there is a problem when you study the Toyota is what is folklore and what is uh, deep stuff? <laughs> and I got it wrong all the time, so I'm now cautious. I realized what I thought was folklore was what they were trying to teach me, which is the tool, the movement, and that whatever deep stuff I was coming up with on my it was on my head. They they would never respond. They would never say yes or no. Actually, they thought I was way out of, I was way over my pay. You know, this was way over my pay grade. And if I wanted to have silly opinions about life and the universe is anything, it was it was fine with them. But they would never respond. Uh, so I think, yeah, the philosophy is, is where, where we Westerners need a philosophy. I'm not sure there is a philosophy in the lean system other than practice a tool and see whatever philosophy you can come up with, but then it's on your head. <laughs> okay, but you just said it was about lean thinking. Um, maybe philosophy isn't uh, the, the right word, but... Um, you have to get an amount of lean thinking before properly uh, starting with the tools, or am I seeing this completely wrong? Well, I would tend to say the opposite, is that by, by, by practicing, you, you act yourself in a way of thinking. By practicing the tool, you start to think differently. You don't think yourself in a way of acting, it's not like you acquire lean thinking and then you use the tool correctly. No, you, it's, it's, I would say this is the you, you practice the tools. The, one thing you have to do, make sure when you practice the tool is ask yourself to start with what is the problem you're trying to solve? Because so often people use the tools and they haven't asked the first question, which is what is the problem we're trying to solve? But um, I, would, I would certainly say that you act yourself in a way of thinking, yeah. 
thinking is a habit like any other habit. And I'm a teacher and I was just a class today and it's it's amazing how no matter how much people understand what you tell them when you just ask them the question again or you put in the situation, they just go back to their thinking habits. The only way to change a habit is to repeat something for 40 times or 40 weeks or for you repeat, repeat, repeat the new thing until you acquire a new habit. And that's what you do with the tools, you repeat. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So how about five more minutes? Anybody else have a question? We'll, we'll wrap up. Maybe a question from our side, Michael. Um, we have it, we've had some conversations about this. I asked you about it previously. Um, offline was uh, around the BPM um, technology um, and uh, using that in a federated environment. Um, maybe it's uh, something that I thought of offline after our initial conversation was, um, is it possible to see BPM technology as a tool um, and nothing more than a tool and to keep the focus on problem solving and, and focusing on, on what needs to be done and uh, getting the people to contribute um, or do you think that the, just the nature of the tool will actually prohibit that kind of uh, um, activity? Uh, do you mean the BPM as the uh, SPC on the SQL on the ERP? I hope that was a, that was a joke what you just said. <laughs> I hope so because I got <laughs> I got three out of the four acronyms, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> means. Could you clarify for me, please? Uh, sorry, I couldn't. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah, the, the technology I'm talking about is specifically here is the IBM BPM um, process engine system that you implement in a, like a banking environment um, to, to manage your processes. I, I wouldn't know. I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with this technology. I, the, the only thing I, if you take the in Berlin, if you take the Jidoka principle, there are two aspects of it. One is the stop a defect, um, and don't make a mistake. You know, don't accept a mistake. Don't make a mistake. Don't pass on a mistake. Um, but the other one is a, a very interesting one, which is separate uh, human work from machine work. So um, what this means is that in any process, uh, the 20th century obsession is how do we mechanize? How do we get rid of human? How do we mechanize processes? But uh, it never works because people are not very good at the spotting the locus of human judgment. So you look at it, okay, where do we need, in order to respond to customers' variety, where do we need human judgment? And the tool guys always tell you it's, it's all the same. We don't need to. We are making, uh, you know, we have our favorite customers because they're the ways we like them. <laughs> and, and the process will work for them. So we're always imposing our process on customers. Um, if you have captive to customers in my work, uh, in a competitive environment, this is just suicidal. So the question is, when you're looking at any kind of uh, autom automation, and I'm really, I think it's great. I think that many things should be taken out of people's hands because they, 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 we shouldn't ask people to do this kind of job. But we have to look very carefully at where the human judgment intervenes in the process. Because if we make mistakes in terms of where the human judgment intervenes as opposed to where the machine judgment intervenes, then we can have a very well automated, that is a completely, uh, that is uh, pissing customers off every day. Um, I, I don't know how to answer your, uh, I'm not familiar with the BPM technology in UN, so I wouldn't know how to answer your specific question. Thank you. Okay, I think um, we're pretty close to done. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, th this was a pleasure, and I can't wait till next month. You, it, but th that acronym thing, that's going to be in our outtakes, okay? We're going to put that in our outtakes when I do a little uh, video for YouTube. So as a reminder for everybody, if you want the YouTube or the, the video for this recording, uh, register in the online office, including the PDF will be there. And, um, and stay behind anybody interested in going to Japan because I've got Rafael Lucero who can answer some questions. Uh, Michael, if you want to take off, I'm more than happy to say goodbye and uh, have a wonderful time. It's, what, 10.20 in France, so 
It's late already. I just want to say, I think, thank you for inviting me. And uh, read, read the book that Georgia put together with Jeff. Um, it, it's very refreshing. It, it blends, uh, back to the question Janneke had on the, the philosophy and the tools. I was just thinking, uh, you know, thinking back to the question. There is one book that somehow brings together, meshes the philosophy of the tools. Is that, what is it? Um, George, Deve you know, developing lean leaders at all levels. A practical guide. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely, it's great. It's it's great fun. It's developing lean leaders at all levels, and it doesn't it doesn't. Would you agree that it meshes the? Uh... You know, absolutely. This is all Jeff Liker intellectual property. So w when I decided to publish it, um, you know, I basically uh, Jeff and I agreed it's all his. This is all out of his head, and all the hundreds of people he met with, both at Toyota, outside of Toyota, and understanding what this is all about and it kind of is a great Toyota culture book, continuous improvement book, a Toyota way book, all put together with some real practical stuff. I mean you can you can apply it. What I love about the book is that it, uh, uh, Jeff, would probably, I hope Jeff doesn't take this badly, but it, it brought me back 20 years ago. Um, now when we have to, because the world is saturated, who needs one more lean book? So we tend to write books with a point and this was coming back to this, there's a rawness in his book about exactly that thing that we're so hard to explain is how do you capture the fact that principles and tools just mesh, that there's no that big difference. And, and that sentiment that, that I, I love that book because it brought me back to when it was so exciting to discover Lean. And, and really I recommend, um, and the, the, his, his four-step development model is absolutely, I think, I think spot on. And, but there's something in the book that, that brought back the excitement of, of lean thinking. So it's, it's Well, you either smile really nice or I can see the excitement. Uh, <laughs> but definitely he won't be upset when you say it's time to go back to the basics because I think it's always that time where we got to go back to the basics sooner or later. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, George. Take care. Uh, Raphael, do you want to talk a little bit about Japan? I don't know if Raphael is there, if he's not. Yeah, go ahead. I have just sent, I have, I have just sent an email uh, information. I have just sent information to all the participants. If anyone is interested in having more information, just uh, send me an email or contact George. and. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're sponsoring it, of board. course. Okay, it will be yeah. in March, beginning March the 1st, and it will be one week, okay? Oh, that's nice. Very good. Uh, thank you, Raphael, and thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Michael, George. Again, thank, thank you. Thank you, Michael, and everybody. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Peter. Take care of Belgium. I know it's late already past your bedtime, Peter. Derek, Chris, everybody, thank you. Bye, George. Thank you, George, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you much. Bye.